And so now we'll take a look at the second table of the law, which begins with the most important, let's see, how does he say that? Oh. We begin with those closest, Luther says, to God in terms of responsibility. Somebody would read Exodus 20, verse 12, please. Now, this is, a, this is a fellow who became a parent fairly late in life, in his 40s, I think. Okay. You know that story? Priests, and he was playing matchmaker for priests who were leaving the Catholic Church and nuns who were leaving the cloister. And there was one load, load of nuns that were brought out of the cloister in barrels that normally held fish. And there was one nun left in this uh, group. And he said to Catherine von Bora, I've got just the right guy in mind for you. And she said, I'm not interested. I'll take you. And so Luther married Catherine von Bora. And she was God's greatest gift to him aside from Jesus Christ. I mean, that's what, that's what Luther would say. Okay? So he's a parent fairly late in life. Not all of his children survived childhood. Well, how many died? Two, I think. Um, anyway, what are parents' responsibilities? Well, we have to raise our children. What does that mean? Yeah, a whole bunch of things. <laughs> keep them safe, yeah, keep them safe, love them, love them the most, yeah, I think I put that one on top. Nurse them. What? Different dimensions to that word, aren't there? Yeah. Education. So, I mean, there's the three R's, or used to be, when we were kids, right? There were the three R's. But raising also has to do with values, I assume that's part of what you were had in mind, Lou. What else? Parents. Keep the right and wrong. Morals, we'll say. Yeah, or values. Okay. Mm -hmm. Values. Um, I, I remember a, a preacher, a woman, very gifted a teacher, talking about her own mother who raised several children, or she raised several children. And at some point, the mother would gift wrap a small box with her apron strings in and send or give the box to her children when she thought the time was right that the apron strings were cut. Do we raise our children? to set them free or set them on their way also. Mm -hmm. okay. And then she told that her youngest brother, he sent it back to his mom and said, I'm not ready. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, some aren't, some aren't, right? But isn't that kind of a neat image? 
Okay. I say, we raise our daughter, think for herself, it drives us crazy that she does. I mean, there, you know, it ain't easy, is it? It ain't easy. All right, so parents have great responsibility, and because of that great responsibility, because this is their calling, To be parents, there are other aspects of our callings, but that is certainly a calling. So Luther's kind of, and Luther's kind of hard on the priests and the nuns. He's not right about everything. Hated the Jews. Very anti-Semitic. Terrible. It's embarrassing how bad Luther was with the Jews. Um, but he's hard on the priests and the nuns because they think that their calling is higher than that of being a parent. Okay? You know pastors like that. I mean, we don't have one, but you know pastors like that who think they have a greater calling than the person that cleans the church or that cooks at Perkins or raises a family. You know, if somebody has a calling, they would say they have a calling, and the rest of us have jobs. You know, I mean, that kind of thinking. Well, Luther's very big on, on understanding and clearly that God has called some people to be parents. Now, if you're not a parent, that doesn't mean you're a bad person or that everybody needs to be a parent to be fulfilled. But to be a parent is a high call. And so we are called to honor not just love, but honor our parents, which is, as I can figure, is the closest to that respect that we owe God. That deep devotion. Okay? Would, you, would you agree that there are some parents who are, it's impossible to honor? We'll talk about that. Okay. Yes, ma'am. We didn't, we didn't rehearse this part, did we? No. <laughs> no. We'll talk about that. So Luther says, honor includes respect, deference, thankfulness, and humility. Do we come by that naturally? That we should honor our parents? Well, I don't know about you, but I didn't. So who teaches us to honor our parents? Our parents, right? That's a part of their responsibility to teach us to honor our parents. And if we do, and our parents are worthy of honor, life is better, right? Not necessarily easy, but better. Okay. So, are parents perfect? Okay. No. And so, when Luther explains the commandment, we are to fear and love God so that we do not despise or anger our parents or others in authority. That others in authority... That is in recognition of the fact that there are no perfect parents and that every parent has limitations. Okay? So, or, to quote Mrs. Clinton, it takes a village to raise a child. Right? And maybe one of the reasons why you stayed in this congregation was because you liked the village or this part of the village that was helping to raise your family. We did at Cross, right? Others in the pool. Who are they? That was my question. I'll ask the question. Who are they, others in authority? Who would you say?
Say elders and clergy. What? Clergy. Uh, you're wrong. Be subject to the governing authorities out of reverence for Christ. That's all. Yeah, but what if the ones in authority have nothing to do with Christ? Or That's a fair question, isn't it, ladies and gentlemen? Father, huh? same kingdom still. Yeah, but is there, I mean, one of the great pastors in the 20th century exercised civil disobedience because the government was wrong? John Miller the same thing. Yeah. It used to be neighbors, but I'm not sure so much that that's that we do that anymore. Yeah. Just like elders are not. Yeah. It used to be that. So these have authority because they are asked or designated to be in a position of authority over our children, okay? We're, we're supposed to be partners in this, okay? Part of the village to raise a child. When does our responsibility to honor our father and mother and when they do <clears throat> when they do mm -hmm. that's Luther's answer I <clears throat> the family that my brothers and I grew up in I, mean, I can picture this clear as a bell we're laying on the living room floor. We fought over who gets the sports page from the evening edition of the, of the paper. You know, so you got ink on your forearms. And mom says, would you get me a can of peas from the basement? And I say, yeah. And dad says, what did you say? I said, yeah. What did you say? I said, yes, ma'am. I mean, it was. And so, I, so I'm, I'm thinking from an early age, I can't wait to be a parent and have somebody honor me. And then it dawns on me as I'm maturing in my Christian faith that my dad at 85 deserves and merits my honor. It's as important then as it was when I was five. And, I mean, I'm, I'm blessed and so is my dad that Michelle felt the same way about my dad, who was no longer my dad the last four years of his life. I mean, because dementia was just eating his brain. But still, that, that's our dad. Okay. And it ended then, and yet still, there's an honor there. You know, we both are, we're both fortunate to have had parents that we have reason to honor or give thanks for to this day. But the responsibility changes when that parent dies. And when parents can't do the job, then society makes other provision. Or the parents do it, but I mean, some parents can't do it. 
there was just on the news tonight, uh, the mother of a teenager who shot and killed four people in a, four students in a school or four people in a school and wounded a bunch of others, she was on trial today. Well, I mean, they weren't up to the task for whatever reason. And nobody stepped in, that's the unfortunate. You know, oftentimes I think when parents are able to <clears throat> fulfill their duties, the list of people that we put up there see that and often intervene, and that can be a saving grace Absolutely. for that kid. How do you respond to people that for a I don't know, what would you say? Yeah, how do you... Somebody doesn't honor their mother or father, and you know it. Do we have a role to play? What would you say? I know the defense from college that were abused. I'm sorry, Dave? I know the defense from college who were abused by a parent. Uh -huh. I could see that they would never want to That's what I mean. That's what I mean. So assuming you're like that. Yeah. yeah how do you... to have a parent who <clears throat> had a very abusive childhood and wasn't well equipped for child rearing and it took me a very long time. <clears throat> my grandmother stepped in and saved my life and a couple teachers and but <clears throat> um, I think that I needed therapy to come to the conclusion that who my mother was was separate from the things she did. Hmm. And that has opened a door for me and I'm able to be with her and tell her I love her and really mean it. And, um, and I, I mourned the mother I didn't have. Hmm. Forgiveness is different than accepting or blessing or ignoring. Or forgetting. Or forgetting, yes. Because you can forgive and never forget. Absolutely. I appreciate you saying that. That's absolutely, yeah. Forgive and forget. That's impossible. And it might, who knows what triggers a change in a person that might, that, that might be the trigger. So. It's not easy.
Appreciate that very much. Other thoughts, comments, questions? All right. Commandment number five, verse 13 of chapter 20. Somebody will read that for us, please. You shall not murder. I wasn't done erasing. Would you read that? Again? <laughs> yeah. You shall not murder. You shall not murder. Now, that's not what we learned, is it, class? Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not kill. Okay. What does this mean? We are to fear and love God so that we do not. But the but no, I'm getting mixed up with number eight. But, but support them in all of life's duties. Okay. I'm retired now. I don't have to remember all those commands. I, I know the commandments. I just don't remember the meanings necessarily anymore. What does it mean to kill? Destroy a life. Huh? Well, you destroy some. Well, I'm looking at kill in the broader sense. You can also destroy things other than a life. But I don't know that we'd talk about that as killing, per se, would we? Okay. Yeah. In the scope of the Sixth Commandment, probably not. Doug? I said it's in the scope of the Sixth Commandment, probably yeah. not. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so to destroy a life or to take a life. Withhold love. What? Withhold love, life for a child. So read, Michelle, read that explanation again. Listen carefully. We are to fear and love God so that we neither endanger nor harm the lives of our neighbors, but instead help and support them in all of life's needs. Okay. And then what did you say then? I said withhold love. Withhold love, okay? So there are different ways to take or destroy a life. That's, that's the point to which you're speaking, right? Yes. That it's not, it is certainly forbidden to strangle somebody until they're dead. But it is also in the don't do this and do that of the commandment, it's also commanded that we not take a life by withholding love and support. So it is appropriate for God to command this because a life is not mine to take. Why not? Because it belongs to God. You're not your own, or your life is not your own. You were bought with a price. Okay? Our Creator and our Redeemer is the one who has a claim on our life. Okay, that's biblical. Okay. So, from the story of Cain and Abel, okay, you know that story? Two brothers. Cain kills his brother Abel. Why? Doesn't say in the story. In, in, excuse me, in Hebrews it says, because Abel's sacrifice, God, God liked it more than Cain's. But it doesn't say that in Genesis. It just says Cain slew his brother Abel. He took what wasn't his. He not only took it from Cain, from Abel, he took it from God. Okay? And what does God do for Cain? Okay. 
banishes him and dies. He marks him so that others will see that Cain's life is not theirs to take. Because Cain, too, belongs to God. The murderer belongs to God. Okay? So then what happens with capital punishment and um, death penalty? And what's the other thing? Assisted suicide. All right. I love, we talked about this last time. It, I love it when the kids put two and two together and get four, and we're multiplying 40 times 40 and getting them, whatever it is, 100, 1,600, okay? So, I'll be asking the questions for the next few minutes. <laughs> you think so, anyway. I could say something, but I'd really get in trouble, so I'm, not, I'm gonna bite my tongue. An 82-year-old man has cancer and pneumonia, and is being kept alive by machines which help him breathe and regulate his heart and give him nourishment. He's been unconscious for four days, and he will not in all probability regain consciousness, let alone get better. At best, doctors think he may live as he is for two more weeks. His family, who love him very much, tell the doctor they are in favor of pulling the plug and taking him off all life supports. Anybody been in that situation? Yeah. It's not a good situation to be in. I mean, it, it's a very difficult situation to be in. What do you think about the family's decision? Are they keeping the commandment? Well, it depends on if the person had a living, a living will, will okay. and said, I do not want to live like that, okay. then the family would be simply carrying out those wishes. Okay. And <clears throat> my personal opinion is that many times in medicine, we do what we can, not what's really in the best interest of that person. <coughs> and truly, if they hadn't been put on a ventilator, they would have died. Sure. So it was medical intervention that prolonged. So I have no issue whatsoever with the family's decision. Anybody else? Okay. A 45-year-old nurse has been found guilty of murder. She's poisoned six people in the nursing home where she works. She's been sentenced to die in the electric chair. What do you think about capital punishment in terms of the commandment? Right? I didn't hear what you said. Oh, I said use Oh, all right. What do you think of capital punishment? Is that in violation of the commandment? I'll, I'll just, I'll, I will say this, in case it makes a difference in your thinking. Luther argues that the government has the power and responsibility to take life in certain circumstances. Now, capital punishment for him would have been a no-brainer. It's not a no-brainer for us. But Luther's thinking more in terms of war. Okay, I got a question about that later. In fact, one of, Luther wrote many treatises, and one of them is on the honorable vocation of the hangman. So what do you think about this nurse guilty of murder? Should she be put to death by the state? I don't think anybody should be put Lil? to death. I don't think anybody should be put to death. Okay. Because it's wrong, it's wrong. 
And so the, the flip side of that is, is the punishment more cruel and unusual to keep somebody in prison for three decades? Or is it less cruel and unusual? I mean, that's in the Constitution or the Bill of Rights or something, right? No cruel and unusual punishment. Anybody else care to come? Well, we're not going to, uh, the, the goal tonight is not to answer all these questions correctly. But, I mean, this is the commandment where the rubber hits the road, right? In 1942, the Colonel flew 26 bombing missions over Europe, primarily focusing on factories making weapons and military bases. In 1943, he was shot down and captured. After six months, he finally escaped, but he killed a guard with a knife in order to do so. What do you think? Was he right to do the things he did? Doug? Under the government? Under the government? Uh, okay. But not everybody would recognize that. Right? Have you watched um, Hacksaw Ridge about the, the uh, pacifist who, be who became a medic? in what, World War II or Korea? Saved hundreds of lives, never part of their life. Because he didn't think anybody should take a life. You might not say that he was correctly doing this, but you could argue he was justified. Certainly mm -hmm. admirable. While driving down the street, John saw a man fall and thought about stopping to help him, but he didn't. It was too cold. He figured sooner or later somebody walking along would help the man. What does the commandment say about John's decision? Michelle, read it one more time. We are to fear and love God so that we neither endanger nor harm the lives of our neighbors, but instead help and support them in all of life's needs. What do you think about John? saw the man fall, didn't stop to help. But the Good Samaritan didn't want him. No. We had four interns at Crossroads and Church while I was there. Amy was our fourth. Our second was a woman, mother of three, the kids were all in their teens or, or older, or maybe it was two. About my age, so she was 50, let's say. And one night she saw a guy walking by the side of the road and she stopped and picked him up, took him to her apartment, had him take a shower, and then fed him part of the beef roast that she had put in the crock pot early in the day. I said to her, don't ever do that again. She didn't know the guy. She took him home, and who's, who's right? She helped him in all his physical needs. I thought she was crazy. Makes you think, though, doesn't it? <laughs> Mr. and Mrs. Doe have decided to not contribute anything to help people who have nothing to eat. Instead, they're going to buy a new bedroom set and travel to London for a month. Some people would say they're breaking the fifth commandment and that they are responsible for the deaths of people they don't help. What do you think? I assume that was either cynicism or sarcasm. Both? Yeah, okay. <laughs> I mean, we've heard it said, right, there's not a food shortage in the world. There's a distribution problem, right? 
seems like a very difficult issue here is the issue of abortion. What? A very difficult issue here is the issue of abortion. Shirley is pregnant and sick. She doesn't want to marry the father of the child she's carrying, nor does he want to marry her. She doesn't want anyone to know she's pregnant either. Ten weeks into her pregnancy, now this was written before the latest round of state legislation. Ten weeks into her pregnancy, she decided it was her body and she had an abortion. I had a high school classmate who was being abused by her uncle. She got pregnant. She was Catholic and her parents said, you have to have this baby. And she committed suicide. I think it's a really, really difficult issue. But I think people should have that right. Michelle? Well, I was just going to say, this is sort of a cop-out, but in many ways, I'm glad that I don't have to make the final decision. Now, I have to figure out how I vote on issues like this. But I think God gets to decide. I will tell you, I... I want to say I'm pro-life. I'm also pro-choice. And I have suggested to two young women, because of their circumstances, that they get abortions. I don't know what they did, but in that, in those two instances, that's what I told them. That was my opinion. Was that the group in the last week or something? There was a couple um, who were told that their child had a serious. Oh, yes, yes. You know, now, this, this stuff of Luther's was written in the 1540s. And government meant the prince or the magistrate. And you've got to believe there were abortions then, yep. right? But not in a hospital. So is the government, is the role of government, I mean, this is the question, isn't it, to forbid or to decide or to permit? Right? I think we get into the third law there. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. 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 I think people should be allowed to make their own choices. So if that's permit, that's where I am. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and with the third use of the law, how much easier to see, no. how can you take the speck out of your brother's eye when you have a law Everyone called him either fatso or pizza face. He was overweight and his complexion was a mess. He had no friends and his life was miserable. But everyone did it so they figured it was okay. The boy dropped out of school and never really amounted to much, but that's just what everyone expected and no one cared. What do you think? Did they kill him? So, 
in some settings, the tendency would be for a person to say, the one command I've never broken is the fifth. Never served in the military, didn't work in a prison, didn't have to make bedside decisions or you know work with families about those kind of very, very tough issues. And so when we say that the law works theologically to show us that we are sinners, this is a part of you know what I mean? Jesus says, you've heard it said, you shall not kill. And I say to you, anybody who's been angry with their brother has committed murder in their heart. That's harsh. If your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. That's harsh too. Right. <clears throat> you know, that's too understanding that line because there's more than one way to kill. Yes, for sure. That person doesn't stop breathing, but they can be destroyed. Mm -hmm. okay. So the commandment, the, the commandment serves to set limits in a society. Vigilante justice is not biblical. If you don't like the decision made by the voters, take up arms. That's not biblical. Okay. But it also, when we realize what is involved in the commandment, we all need a savior. If you have a brother, you have committed murder in your heart. At least once. Right? If not, hours. Especially when they cheat when you're playing basketball on the driveway, okay? Or they keep saying it's your turn to unload the dishwasher and you know darn well it's not your turn because your fingers are wrinkled and their hands are perfect. You have committed murder, I have, in my heart. So, Except Jesus says, if you have, if you have anger towards your brother, you commit a murder in your heart. There should be an X check. So you know what it says right after that? I checked it out this afternoon. So if you are preparing to give your offer in the church or in the temple. Leave your gift before the altar, don't put it on the altar, and go and make peace with your brother first. What's more important? Now, it was a day that you might said there's nothing more important than the offer on Sunday morning. Jesus says there is, and it's making peace, which is why in most churches, most Lutheran churches, the peace is shared after the creed and the prayers and before the offering. Okay. I'm not saying we're wrong, I'm just saying normally that's why normally the offering is right before, I mean the sharing of peace is right before the offering, because that's what Jesus said. Look at that, quarter after. I heard the bell, I don't know who heard, I heard the bell. So next time, we'll run through six, seven, eight, nine, and 10. We should be able to get those done next Tuesday. 